You'll hear a woman complaining about an item she has bought. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah, oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that okay? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y O R K E. Okay. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat one, twenty five Alpine Avenue. That's A L P I N E Avenue, Harchester. The postcode is H A six five L D. Okay, next. Could you give me your telephone number? Preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours. Well, the home one is o one seven three four, five two five two six eight, but you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number then. All right, my mobile number is o seven eight one two double three four five two. And do you have the order reference number on you by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's D M X eight double four three. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the first of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh yes, here it is, January the fifteenth. Okay, I'll make a note of that. So the item is a digital camera. Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. 
I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, but when she took it on holiday and tried to use it underwater, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper, and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine, touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off-road, do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right, well, the rate will be £50 for a week or £14 per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week? Yes, definitely. Though it's important to bring the bike back on time, otherwise I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's £1.25. So if you were a day late, it would cost another £30? Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that then. I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle. In good condition, of course. On touring models, it's £60. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? Well, for another £5, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry, and the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that. Or for a lock. It's a good strong one, too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me. What about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental, too. And it covers everything, does it? Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes, as long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first £100. Hmm, so if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque or would it have to be cash? 
Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be OK? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK, fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists, and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid $1,500 for a stamp design and a further $800 if the committee actually decides to use the design.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest. And because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular, or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia. With the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps, no living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about 2,000 ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens, for instance, King Henry VIII famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about architecture. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 36. During today's seminar, we will be looking at English Gothic architecture and its origins with a specific case study of Wells Cathedral in England. The Gothic style was initially brought over to England from France. This was at a period of time in which England was ruled from France by the Normans, starting with William the Conqueror, who first defeated the English army at the Battle of Hastings on October 14, 1066. After 1072, when some smaller rebellions in northern England had been defeated, the Normans gained complete control of the English monarchy, which they controlled until 1154. The peace that ensued in England had a large impact on many aspects of daily life. Thousands of French words entered the English language for the first time, such as beef, fruit, city and hour. French ideas and styles, like Gothic, also began to flow across the Channel to England too, examples of which can still be seen in the architecture of many listed buildings. 
A listed building is one that is protected from alteration or demolition because of its historical or stylistic importance. One such building is Wells Cathedral. Construction on Wells Cathedral began in 1175, at a time when Gothic architecture as a style was in its infancy. As a result, it is one of the first entirely Gothic buildings ever constructed. From the first design to the date it was completed in 1490, Gothic architecture flourished in England. Therefore, later additions to the building were still influenced by this Gothic style, rather than by later architectural styles such as Tudor architecture. Older cathedrals in England would have initially been influenced by Romanesque architecture, alternatively known as Norman architecture in England. As the former name suggests, Romanesque was a building style based on the skills passed on to various areas of Europe by the Romans. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, these methods were retained by Rome's former colonies and developed further. One such Roman gift to the Romanesque architects was the round arch, also known as the true arch. The Romans perfected this style by using wedge-shaped stones called voussoirs, which created pressure that held the structure together at the top. Cathedrals in England, such as the ones in Ely and Canterbury, were started before the arrival of Gothic architecture. Even though parts of those two cathedrals, which were constructed later, are in the Gothic style, other sections predating the arrival of Gothic architecture are Romanesque. The result is known as eclectic because the building is constructed using more than one style. All of these cathedrals belong to a group known as the Medieval Cathedrals of England. There are 26 different buildings that belong to this group in total, all of which were constructed or added to during a 500-year period from 1040 to 1540. The transition from Romanesque to Gothic began in 1144 at the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis on the edge of Paris. It was here that a Benedictine abbot by the name of Suger had just completed his plan to rebuild the Basilica of Saint-Denis in a new style through which he believed the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material. This refers to one architectural feature in particular – high, rib-vault ceilings which created much more space inside the cathedral and were designed to draw the attention of people up towards heaven. This design feature also allowed whole walls of the cathedral to be transformed by colourful stained glass. Work started on Wells Cathedral soon afterwards, greatly inspired by Abbot Suger's work. Planned in the crucifix style with the head pointing east and foot pointing west, the cathedral is 126 metres long and the nave is 20 metres high. This is quite low compared to some of the bigger cathedrals elsewhere. Use of tracery, lancet windows and mullions are all characteristic of English Gothic architecture. Whilst examples of all three of these architectural elements can be found at Wells, the lancet windows have no tracery at all, which was more common in early English Gothic architecture before advances were made in the use of mullions and tracery with glass. Lancet windows are tall, thin windows with a pointed arch at the top and are so named because they resemble the weapon often carried by a soldier called a lance. Examples of these lancet windows can be seen on the west front of the cathedral, which is the most celebrated for its life-size sculptures and delicate floral carvings. Inside the pinnacle-topped gable is a sculpture of Christ the Judge. Immediately below him, sculptures of the Twelve Apostles peer out over the small city of Wells. 
Below the apostles are nine archangels, which are half-sized sculptures. At one time, all of these, along with the decorative carvings, would have been painted and gilded. However, today, all the paint has worn away and the sculptures are the colour of the oolite sedimentary stone used to construct the cathedral. It is remarkable to think that more than 800 years ago, such magnificent buildings were created without the use of large cranes and modern technology. It would have taken much longer, but it is possible to see the high level of craftsmanship and attention to detail that is less common in the modern day. That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to Team R Stream. I'm RP and you are watching the IELTS Listening Test Channel. I'm super excited to announce that on your demand we have started a series of writing task 1 and writing task 2. Today I'm going to explain how to write effective writing task 2. If your dream is to achieve 8, 8 plus, this video is for you. So are you ready? Here we go. So let's get started with statement. It is important for children to learn difference between right and wrong at an early age. Punishment is necessary to help them to learn this distinction. Distinction means difference. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the opinion? With this opinion. I always advise my students to understand your statement before you start writing and make the plan accordingly. So I devoted some time to make a plan and to write certain ideas and I have written it with introduction. So, children must be able to comprehend difference between right and wrong from an early stage of life. Here it was at an early age. I have written an early stage of life. And here was important for children to learn difference. And here I have written able to comprehend difference between right and wrong from an early stage of life. A very nice way to rephrase your sentence to write your introduction. It is argued that punishing them is essential so as to make them understand such moral ethics. So people argue, people say that punishing them is essential means very very important. So as to make them understand such moral ethics. To make them understand such moral ethics. I mean moral responsibilities or what moral ethics it means moral values. I largely agree with the statement and think that appropriate punishment. Appropriate punishment should be given to youngsters for their mistakes. I mean, I'm talking about appropriate punishment should be given. I mean, parents should give them appropriate punishment. I mean, punishment that must be appropriate. I mean, suitable kind of punishment. Okay, very nice introduction. And now, let's begin with BP1. To commence with the view of disagreement, it's a nice way to start. It's a nice introductory phrase. To commence with the view of disagreement, I mean why I disagree with the view, with the statement. Kids should not be punished ruthlessly, I mean I am not in favor of punishing them ruthlessly, I mean I am against of hard punishment, punish ruthlessly, I mean hard punishment. For their minor misdeeds, minor mistake mean minor mistakes. Nice. I am going to explain side by side and you can note it down to score higher plays. Because this kind of conduct, conduct when behavior, may affect their mental health in a detrimental way. I mean, it can have detrimental effect, mean negative impact or adverse effect. Which might also result in again how to enlarge your sentence and make it effective. So which might also result in an 
overall negative environment at home leading to children constricting themselves in their cell even cutting themselves from their near and dear ones so these are the negative impact on children I mean constricting themselves in their cell it mean they can stay just in their room even cutting themselves from their near and dear ones and they won't have strong relationship with near and dear one they will cut from them so nice explanation such situation can also cause lifetime trauma trauma it means something bad something extremely bad serious things like trauma center you must have heard about it trauma center so lifetime trauma in a few cases which may become a constant hurdle for children to face on a daily basis so constant hurdle it means consistent problem shifting toward the view of agreement I mean why i agree with the point it can be observed that not questioning and aiding youngsters for their mistake have long term consequences due to the fact that children want to be able to understand fundamental principle of right and wrong and as a result they will be constantly practicing misdeeds and without even feeling apologetic toward their misbehavior nice 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 explanation when it shows that your range of english is very nice and you uh, deserve to get 8 it plus band so i mean not questioning and aiding youngsters for their mistakes I mean we should not aid we should not help them when they make mistake and if we do so then it will have long term consequences I mean negative impact due to the fact that children want to be able to understand fundamental principles I mean basic principle of right and wrong I mean what is right and what what is wrong and as a result they will become constantly practicing mistakes I mean they will continue uh, uh you know will make mistake and without even feeling apologetic toward their misbehavior and they will not feel apologetic I mean they will not feel even sorry they will not say even sorry if they misbehave for instance if a child has a habit of misbehaving with elders but no one question them for this later on even if they may achieve respectful job then that child may take their job for granted for granted mean they will take that job easy and start talking badly to everyone and not even respecting their colleagues not respecting their colleagues mean the people who are working with he will not respect respect even those people having an adverse impact on the child career and it will negatively affect negatively affect a uh, child's career as well thus required steps should be taken by elders for their children misconduct as soon as possible so required steps should be taken by elders when elders should take some urgent steps or some appropriate steps so that children don't misbehave further strengthening my view if kids behavior is not taken for granted and relevant steps are taken by their parents so we should not uh, take their behavior for granted I mean we should not take it so easy and relevant steps are taken by their parents I mean we should take some relevant steps if we don't do so youngsters will automatically feel responsible I mean if we take uh, relevant steps and if we don't take their behavior for granted so they will automatically feel responsible they will become responsible and liable for their action responsible and liable I mean they will become responsible for their action I mean the things they do in their life therefore they will most probably act as not only a beautiful family member but also a sensible citizen I mean it will help them uh, not only become a beautiful family member but he will definitely become a sensible citizen as well and this is how I have written conclusion to conclude punishment ought to be given to children in a judicious manner as i have described in my introduction appropriate punishments and here i have written in a different way I mean punishment should be judicious judicious again I mean we should give them punishment wisely and appropriately as it will help them to become overall a nice human being I mean they will become nice human being if we take certain action or if we give them punishment it can be but appropriate punishment not 
hard punishment or not ruthless punishment so this is how now you now it's easy for you to understand that how effective you can write your essay and you can score higher this is the end of the video but uh, hit the like button and subscribe our channel for more videos bye bye